Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Well, how many of you are here this afternoon? Put up your hand. Most of you are. We're really excited to be uh, with you today in this particular workshop. I know you had others to choose from, so I'm really glad that you've expressed an interest in cell ministry. In fact, I have to tell you right off the bat that in the South, the word cells is a two-syllable word. Sales. Come on, let's see you try that out. You're doing great. You're really doing great. I want to just uh, start off by a scripture verse that uh, I think will help us a little bit. And that's in Acts chapter 19. And I want to point out just for a moment concerning the Apostle Paul. Acts chapter 19, verse 7. We read about the baptism and the Holy Ghost being poured out and revival in verse 6 when Paul had laid his hands upon them. The Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And then the seventh verse is a little often uh, neglected because of the power of the sixth verse. It says, and all the men were about 12. Now, you know, I want to say this afternoon a, a little bit about coupling together uh, revival and a principle called the principle of 12. And you'll notice that the Apostle Paul was a man who moved in mighty revival. In this same chapter, the Bible says the Lord wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. And yet it was through these 12 men who received the Holy Ghost that all of Asia heard the word. We also see, and I just want to notice something with you in this same chapter, that the Apostle Paul traveled, actually Acts chapter 20 and verse 4, it says, And there to accompany him into Asia, Sopater of Berea, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derbe, and Timotheus, and of Asia, Tychicus, and Trophimus. Now that lists six or seven of the people who traveled with Paul. Over in Philemon, there are three more, and in Philippians, there are two more. And we can actually trace about 12 guys who traveled everywhere with Paul. Now, what I want to talk to you about this afternoon is how revival actually is to be contained within the local church. How many of you believe in the local church this afternoon? I mean, that's why we're here. Revivals are, are very powerful all over the world. Brother Reinhard Bonnke was here Tuesday night. He's a dear friend of mine. Uh, wrote me an email about 400,000 people saved in a single service recently. And his heart cry, though, as he sees those millions saved, is how do we follow them up? How do we assimilate them? How do we disciple them? And how do we turn them into leaders? So I want to start off with a little illustration up here. And by the way, completely disregard what's in your booklet. Uh, I'm, going to I'm going to teach you a little bit out of a lesson I handed you. And you can use the notes you got in your booklet. They'll all reinforce what I'm going to say. But I want to notice with you three purposes of the church. And I'm going to write these up here on the board. And these three purposes tell us what every local church is supposed to be accomplishing. If you study the ten largest churches around the world, you're going to find that they're all into three things in a critical mass type of a way. The first one, can everybody see these in the back? If you can't, you may need to move a little bit closer because we don't need the whole building. You can move a little closer where you can see the board a little bit better because I'm going to use it quite a bit during this next uh, hour and a half. Prayer, cells, and missions. Say that out loud. Prayer, cells, and missions. Say it one more time. Prayer, cells, and missions. I want you to have that somewhere in your notes. I want it to be riveted. It's in the first little handout that I gave you. And a lot of times when we talk about cells, we forget that there are really two other components that, that both focus on the middle one. And, you know, cells are a structure. We're going to talk about how cells actually change the structure of your church in a minute. But never forget that cells do not generate revival. Cells contain revival. Sometimes pastors come to our conferences, and we had one two weeks ago. We had about 1,600 pastors and leaders from around the world there studying cells. And I always start with this lesson because they think because we change structures, we experience revival. That's really not the case. We're in revival in our church. We usually baptize between 25 and 30 people every week and uh, have 50 to 60 people saved every weekend. So we're, we're in the midst of revival. We have been for the last 
uh, number of years. And cells were really birthed out of a cry to contain the revival, pastor those people well, disciple them, and turn them into leaders. So let's start just for a moment with prayer. And I know this church emphasizes it a lot, and sometimes you guys are more interested in the mechanics of revival and how it's done, but you may miss the fact that it's intercession that birthed this entire move of God. Can I have an amen to that? Amen. I mean, intercession, the Tuesday night meeting uh, is actually pivotal. Uh, Brother Kilpatrick said last night, two and a half years of intercession went into the, the beginnings of this revival. I'm on Dr. Cho's board, just returned from Korea a couple of weeks ago. And Dr. Cho was reminding us of how prayer in Korea has birthed the largest churches in the world. And there are a hundred prayer mountains in Korea. Go to the prayer mountains and, and see the little shoes outside the door. And people who've been up in there with a, with a, a jug of water for days and days fasting and praying. 30,000 on Prayer Mountain every Friday night. When they pray, it sounds like a waterfall and, and they have to ring a bell to get them to stop. It, you know, we must understand that cells is not the solution to the church. It's not the thing that's going to make anything whatsoever different. Prayer is the thing that's going to bring God on the scene. Can I have an amen? amen. So we, we emphasize prayer. In our cells, we have prayer walks. We now have 600 small groups in our church. And, and they do prayer walk and we'll have a, a night where every group will walk. Sometimes they walk through schools. Principals open the school and let them lay hands on every locker. We walk around churches, 500 churches in our city. We walk around and ask the Lord to pour out His Spirit on those churches. We walk around strongholds and high places and all kinds of stuff. So prayer is like an integral part for us. Now in your handout, I mentioned something. You really don't even have to look at it. In 1992, the night Bill Clinton was elected, my spirit was very heavy at the direction America was moving in. I'm a very pro-life pastor. We're deeply involved in the pro-life movement. And I knew that he was not pro-life. And, and my spirit was really grieved about that. I went in my study. And about 1 o'clock in the morning after the election results had come in, the Lord visited me. And I'm not going to say it was an open vision or an audible voice or anything. I just had an impression just suddenly. He said, there are two things coming in America. He said, there's harvest. Major harvest is coming in America. Now, I was a missionary in Nigeria, and then I had held crusades in Russia quite a bit as a pastor. We'd seen thousands run to an altar in Moscow. So I knew what real harvest was like. 3,000 were saved in one night in one of those meetings. I knew what harvest was like, but I'd almost given up on America. I just didn't believe we'd ever see real harvest in that, that night of November 1992. But the Lord said, you will see thousands and tens of thousands of baby boomers and others who are desperate for God running to altars. Now, we've seen a measure of it here. This is the first fruits of major harvest. I, I don't really think you and I can conceive that this is just God saying, you see, it can happen. There are going to be churches like this throughout America with tens of millions of new converts. Can I have an amen to that? And it hadn't happened yet, but look, the next decade is the decade of the double. Hallelujah. But he also said there's coming hostility. He said the church is going to experience harvest and hostility. We're already starting to see the second one as well begin as churches. Uh, we had a church in our area, had a, a gunman go in and shoot four people and kill them on a Wednesday night. That was in the national news several months ago. It's happened in a Baptist church. We don't predict that, look for it, want it, or anything. But there is a widening chasm between us and the culture of death and the culture of the world. And, and we're having to stand for life and stand for righteousness. So we are going to see in the next decade hostility as well. And he said to me that night, your church is not ready for either one. And I'm going to show you something that's going to prepare you for that. Well... Within a month, I'd received a book that described the cell church around the world. I've been a missionary. I have a real heart for missions. And I have a respect for the third world cultures of the world. And even though we're Americans and we, you know, really believe that we do church the best, uh, there, there are some mighty big ones around the world. Have you noticed that? I was in uh, Korea in 1995 in a workshop for pastors of churches over 100,000 members. And the room was full, but there were no Americans there. And so we, we do a good job with church, but we have a little bit to learn. Am I right about that? One guy in West Africa was there, and he has uh, 80,000 members 
in cells with no computers or zip codes. He, he uh, has 6,000 cells. A church in Bogota has 24,000 cells now. They have uh, 6,400 cells just in their youth department alone. Are you breathing? They, uh, I, I've seen in Manila a church of 30,000 with 2,000 groups and on and on and on it goes. And, and yet people told me cell groups cannot work in America. As I was reading this book, it described uh, a different structure, which I'm going to talk to you about in just a minute, how the, the structure of your church can, it can change to actually uh, hold cells in a way that they multiply, they're evangelistic and so forth. But prayer was how we started in cells. In the spring of 1993, I visited a number of churches around the world in Singapore, in Korea, uh, in uh, El Salvador, a church of 100,000 with 6,000 cells in South Africa. And I saw a common thread in all of them. They had mighty prayer as the base of their whole ministry. So I came back from those journeys I had a, a prayer base in my church of about 500 intercessors. We turned those 500 people into 54 cell groups. And, and really, we can say that prayer has been the absolute basis of our cells and what has made them work. So I'm only emphasizing that momentarily here, but you must realize cell groups do not, I emphasize, do not bring revival to your church. If there's no fire there uh, before you institute what I'm going to teach you today, then you're, you're really just walking a dead horse. Somebody said, you know, it, it's, if people are ice skating in the aisles, there must be a polar bear in the pulpit. And, and we need to be sure there's fire in us. Amen? Come on, say fire. fire. It's not fire, it's fire. fire. We, we need it in our churches, and we're, that's why we're here at this conference. We, we are praying it down. Why don't you take a minute and lift your hands and just ask the Lord to visit your church, and, and, and then the container is going to be easy. Lord, we just praise you right now that you're sending fire. Lord, I just thank you that these pastors are full of fire. And Lord God, that they are here from all over the country and all over the world, Lord, so that their churches can experience renewal and restoration and complete transformation, Lord. We just ask you to send the fire, Lord. We thank you you're going to give us nets that will hold the harvest and that you're giving us wisdom, Lord, to implement it and to, and to challenge our people as they move into it. And we give you the glory. Let's give Jesus a hand clap again. He's so wonderful. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. That, that's the first half of your handout. The other part I want to touch on before I talk about cells is missions. You know, uh, every, again, major church around the world emphasizes missions. And sometimes pastors have no missions vision whatsoever. And uh, they're just focused on Brunhilde Hucklemeister and don't let her leave, Lord, please. And, and that's their whole focus is just their, their little flock. But we are focused on the world. There's six billion people on this planet, six billion. And at least three billion we know, 3.7 billion are in the D world or the unreached world. And I've written a book on that because if you take those people and you line them up chest to back without a piece of paper between them, that line would go all the way around the world at the equator and come back in another door. In fact, it would circle the globe 25 times around the equator. That's just the unreached sector of Earth's population. So we have no business being worried about somebody who, who is upset the air conditioning is not set just right in our sanctuaries. We, we are dealing with a massive project of reaching the world. And so I, I feel as a pastor, if you are a soul winner and you have a focus on the harvest and the multitudes and your vision is big as the world is huge and the need is, then cells again will be a natural thing because when we talk about cells in a few moments, I'm going to be talking about evangelistic cells. I'm not talking about little koinonitis groups, if you know what I mean. I mean the navel gazing societies that sit around and eat fritos and, and wasn't this nice. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about uh, cells that have a passion 
to win the world. And if you focus on missions, they'll focus across the street to win their neighbor. So uh, in your hand also, I just wanted to leave this with you, is a profile. Did everybody get a, a, an unreached people profile? I hope you did. We've written a profile on each of the unreached people groups of the world, 1,735 unreached people groups. And uh, that's a, a, a copy of one uh, right there. You can get them on the internet as well. But we pass them out at the door to our members and they pray over profiles every week. Uh, our cell groups pray over profiles every week and we're, we're targeting the unreached. We send teams to the unreached people groups of cells and cell leaders. So I wanted you to understand that our cell vision was birthed out of two flames that were already burning deeply in the heart of our congregation, and that is prayer and missions. Now we're going to come to this third one. Has everybody got this? I'm going to go ahead and erase this down, and I'm going to get started on the middle one right now, and that is cells and what they can do for your church. And, and by the way, I'll just give you a little bit of our testimony. In, in April, we started 54 groups. Dr. Cho came, preached for us the, the week we started, uh, 54 cells. They multiplied to 108 by October of that year, and then uh, 200 the following year, 300 the following year, and then we ran out of leaders. I, I kid about it. I tell people that we were trying to get people to, to quit smoking just to become a leader. I mean, that's kind of where we were. Uh, and, and, and then we backed up. We started doing leadership training. Now we have 600 groups. Our goal is 1,000 groups uh, next year. In fact, two weeks ago, we remodeled our auditorium we have a 6,000 seat auditorium there in Baton Rouge, and we remodeled it for two weeks, uh, changing out the carpet, and we didn't have church for two weeks. Uh, two Wednesdays and a Sunday, we couldn't meet because the, the uh, pew people were in there moving pews, and it was just impossible to meet. So uh, on October 10th of, of this last month, uh, we had church on Sunday in cells. And we had a huge attendance, almost 80% of our congregation was in a cell that morning. Our offering was about 80% of what it, uh, what it normally is. And at the end of October, we had not uh, missed any of our offering whatsoever. Our offering was, was the normal uh, offering and uh, all the people came back. People said, you're gonna lose all your members you know, if, if you don't have church on a Sunday. But I'm really not insecure about that at all because they're so connected to a cell and to relationship within our church that they don't jump you know, to the, to the next horse and pony show. They, they love the vision of what we're doing. And so I was in Korea for two weeks with Dr. Cho, no services while I was gone, didn't affect our church whatsoever, except we added people the next week. And uh, I showed a video sermon that Sunday and, and they had dinner on the ground and Lord's Supper and all of that. So this was a first in American history as far as we know of a church being fully transitioned where uh, everybody has a cell and they're not, uh, not even a necessity to have a service if, if the lights went out. Somebody called it a Y2K run through, I don't know. But anyway, uh, I, I personally believe everything's gonna be fine on Y2K, how about you? But. Nonetheless, we are fully transitioned now. After six years, uh, cells is all we have. And I want to just start off uh, by pointing out a little, little thought that Brother Kerry alluded to just then about structure. Now, you know, uh, normally you have, in a computer system, you have programs. And this was about five years ago, you had a menu. And you had this program and this program and this program and this program. And you could only run them one at a time. When you were running this one, you couldn't be running this one because they didn't talk the same language. I don't know if any of you remember back that far with computers. And then along came uh, the guy named Bill Gates who's in the news all the time. And Bill developed something called a window, which was a unifying operating system for all programs. And now he had this program and this program and this program that all appeared on the same window. So they were in this same environment. And he took uh, a little mouse and he'd click this one and this one and this one, and they could all be operating simultaneously without competing with each other or, or any problems. And that made him the richest man in the world, in fact. So uh, this is actually what the Lord showed us about cells. Cells is an operating system for the church. It is not a program. In fact, for most of us, as it was for me before 1993, this was my cell program right here. 
and then I had benevolence ministry here, and then I had a follow-up ministry here, and, and I had a ministry for redheads over 29, under 31 here, and then, you know, just various programs. And some churches in America have 100 programs, 150 programs, just every niche and every uh, type of thing. But, but what we're talking about with, when we say the cell church is we're talking about taking all of those programs and cellularizing them. In other words, having those people actually become members of a cell that do those type of functions. And now we have a, an environment, an operating environment, in which all of those ministries are still being done. We still have follow-up, but it's done in cells. We still have benevolence, but it's done in cells. We still actually do all of our greeters and ushers and everything by cells because they rotate. I now have 12 zones in our church, like Solomon had the 12 tribes that fed Jerusalem once a month. And we do that same thing. We have 12 zones and, and uh, I have about 50 cells per zone. And they just take over the church one Sunday. They do the ushers and the greeters and the nursery, parking lot, uh, everything. And then the following week, they're off duty for 11 more Sundays. They don't get a chance to serve, you see. And so we have no more volunteers or anything like that. Everything's done in rotation because it's a structure whereby the, all of those ministries that you used to have individually have been replaced by the same operating system of cells. Now, what I'd like to do, having laid that concept for you, I'd like to talk a little bit about the four purposes of the church. And like I say, I don't even know what's in your little outline there. Somebody sent over a tape or something here and they transcribed it, I believe. But I, I'm, what, I, what I'm giving you will, will be a little bit, I think, more concise even than in your notes. Four purposes of the church. Now these should still be right in that handout I just gave you. Four purposes of the church. And as I, as I do church, uh, I, I constantly remind myself of these things because uh, we know that the first purpose that the church has is to preach the gospel. That, that's, that's an essential. That's evangelism. This is our first purpose. The second purpose of the church is to pastor believers. Now I'll get to all this. I'm giving you an overview right now. The third purpose of a church is to prepare disciples. And the fourth purpose of the church is to plant leaders. Now my first question for all of us this afternoon is, how, how well are we doing that? Uh, how well are we preaching the gospel? Well, we're all doing a pretty good job at that because we do focus on the loss, we have door-to-door -door stuff, we have all kinds of things, chihuahuas jumping through flaming hula hoops and all types of stuff that we do to preach the gospel. Then we pastor believers pretty well, but when a church gets over 50 people, 60 people, 100 people, uh, people start kind of falling between the cracks and, and, and they no longer are transparent like they were when a church was 15, 20, 30 people. So you get where they're more and more distant. When you get to 500 people, people like the anonymity and they then 1,000 people and then 2,000, 5,000 people start going to the hospital and dying with no one knowing. I mean, it, 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 it really gets serious. So pastoring believers, maybe you're doing a great job of that. We weren't particularly doing that wonderful of a job. Preparing disciples is something that we find even less of in a church because most people prefer just to show up on Sunday but never make a real serious commitment to the disciplines of the Christian life like Bible study, prayer, fasting, you know, the real discipline part. And then to actually plant leaders or turn an average Christian, a Joe Christian who comes in and is just there, maybe ties, to turn him or her into a leader where they look at themselves as a leader in the church is only happening for a fraction of people. For instance, in your congregation, if you have 100 people, you should have 15 people in your church who are in a weekly ministry. At least 15 who are leaders. Dr. John Maxwell says that 15% of your church should be involved in a weekly ministry. Or our church, 6,000 people, we should have 900 people every week involved in a weekly ministry. And that's a healthy leadership base in the church. Well, we didn't have that. We, we didn't have even a tenth of that. 
uh, six years ago. So I want to take these one at a time, and I'm going to show you, of course, you're, you're probably familiar with Rick Warren's circles of, uh, of how he teaches the church uh, is, is comprised. First of all, is the community out here. The community. And that's who we're preaching to, the lost world. And then you got believers right in here. And that's, uh, that, that's the crowd. And then you got the committed, or the congregation rather, right here. And then you come to the core, the committed, I'm sorry. And then you come to the core. Now Rick says that the goal of evangelism is to move people from the community to the crowd, to get them in church at least once, uh, uh, once every month or however, like, you know, so that they just start making a commitment. Then the goal of pastoring people is to move them from the crowd, the Easter Bunny bunch, to weekly tithing in there with you. That's the goal of pastoring. The goal of preparing disciples is to move them from just a tither to a person who's committed. They're in a cell, they're serious, Bible study in prayer, Bible study group, whatever. And then the goal of leadership training is to move them from the committed to the core. And the core being 15% of your church are people who are leaders in a weekly ministry. Now, he has a system of how they do that. We don't, we don't particularly operate through this, but I'm just showing you all over the world, I have studied very large churches that have to pastor 100,000, 200,000. They all do these four things, preach, pastor, prepare, and plant. And they have a serious structure of how to make that happen. Now, what we did is come up with a baseball diamond. And I'm going to, if I can erase this, I'm going to show you how how the baseball diamond works for us. It's very simple, but it works beautifully. And we have people going around our baseball diamond right now by the hundreds. And the good thing about it, as soon as they get water baptized, they start the baseball diamond. Uh, I took my whole church through this starting in January of this year. I just finished in September. We taught them the entire thing of what I'm about to show you. Now, this is home base. Everybody familiar with baseball? I know we have some out of the United States uh, people. So in case you don't know about baseball, uh, baseball is a game where you hit a ball and then you run to a base and you stop. And there's a first, a second, a third base, and then home is a, is a home run or when you score a run. Now, this is what we really think of as evangelism, preaching the gospel, and an event, water baptism. That's the goal. We preach the gospel and people get saved. Then we come to first base and we call this Christianity 101. It's a booklet. It's about six lessons that help people to know who they are. Now we're fulfilling the first purpose of the church and that is to preach. And we're doing it right and we're baptizing people. This happens on Sunday nights, 5 o'clock. Like I said, between 25 and 30 people are usually baptized every Sunday night in our church. And the moment that we do that, we put this booklet in their hand. And we teach them the first lesson, which is on repentance and water baptism. And they are immediately involved in a cell. Now, that brings us to the second purpose of the church, and I'm going to bring this around uh, for you, and that's to pastor, to pastor believers. And we do this partially through what we call an encounter retreat. An encounter retreat. We learned this in Bogota. They, they, their youth ministry in Bogota uh, has 600 new converts every Saturday night. And they, they have retreats uh, that they take 100 young people on, six different retreats every weekend called Encounters. And they deal with them on drugs, uh, past abuse, uh, cleansing stream type issues for uh, two days, two nights, uh, get them filled with the Holy Ghost, 
and the kids come back from those retreats and, and break up with unsaved boyfriends on the parking lot. I mean, they, they're completely different. Now, as I have understood American Christianity, this is the place where we're hurting big time, right, right in here. Because we've got them walking forward by the thousands. And they feel a touch. But how many of you know they don't need a touch, they need a change. Isn't that right? So some people, the touch changes them. It's so deep. Some people, they feel the presence of God, but they never deal with the life-controlling issues that are actually going to keep them down the line from being a happy Christian or being a leader. It's a long way to being a leader. And unless you deal with those issues right up front, then down the line, the person will flake out on you or, or you don't know what's wrong, but they have a real serious problem. So we bring all of our new converts on an encounter retreat. We pay $20. They pay $20. It's a little retreat facility, but they come back completely transformed. We have people from all over the world now coming, just going on encounter retreats and watching it happen. It's nothing unusual, but it's just powerful. And people are getting delivered and getting set free. So we're pastoring people better. When they come out of this, we let them enroll in a class called Discipleship 201. Discipleship 201. That's second base. And again, a 12-week booklet that helps them go through the basics of overcoming temptation, uh, studying the Word, how to pray, how to fast, how to hear the voice of God, just elementary disciplines. This takes place in our church presently on Wednesday night. Uh, that could change. We may not have Wednesday night in, in a couple more months. But uh, it, for now, it's there. It's a class they attend. Each district of our church does a, uh, a Discipleship 201 course. So we always have people coming off of, and by the way, every district, I have five districts in our church, and every district does their own encounter retreat. And uh, when those people come off of that, they plug them into their own class. So they're actually hands-on discipling people as they go around the basis. And then uh, we come to another event, which we call a Discovery Seminar. Because we've now accomplished two of the major purposes, uh, or three rather. We've already accomplished preaching to them. We've already pastored them well for 12 weeks. And now we're ready to move to the next one, and that is their spiritual gifts. We feel like they're cleaned up. We've dealt with the root issues, and they're ready to know who they are. This is a Saturday seminar, and I think I tell a little bit more about it in your notes, but it's, it's people learning their DNA as a Christian, you know, their spiritual aptitude and so forth. And then they're able to enroll in Leadership 301. Leadership 301, again, a 12-week class on Wednesday night. Now we're getting serious. Because this person is stepping up to the plate and saying, I'm going to be a leader. We deal with their family. We deal with time management issues. We deal with how they handle their money, their, their motives. Uh, we start really getting down in these 12 lessons to the serious nitty-gritty issues of leadership. It helps them also on the job, by the way, because one of our cell leaders has, has gone from just being an office person. She's now the Undersecretary of Health and Human Services in Louisiana. She's really, you know, I think she has 3,500 employees and a $200 million a year budget. And she learned all of that through leadership principles that, that we taught her. So Leadership 301, great thing for them. And when they get through with all of that, we take them on a champion's retreat. And uh, that's just a reward, really, for their hard work. But on this retreat, we are laying hands on them to become a leader in our church. I teach a sermon from Rick Godwin called Sons or Servants on this retreat. And it differentiates between a person's agenda, either being a hireling in the church or having an inheritance in the church, that they are like a son or a daughter and that this is their ministry and they would never do anything to hurt it. They would never be disloyal or anything like that. So we really deal in the Champions Retreat with motives and all of that before we ever pray over them. Then we bring them before the church the following Sunday. We lay hands on them and they're now able to start their own cell group. Now we've had, as I mentioned, 600 people now go all the way around the bases. We have hundreds of people who are on the bases right now. In fact, I believed in it so much that in January, as I mentioned, I passed out uh, actually 8,000 Christianity 101 books in January. 
and then 8,201 and 301, and I just taught the whole congregation from January to September. I brought my entire church around the bases, and the last lesson was the week before we didn't have church. <laughs> And, uh, and so I'm not worried about people running off and going everywhere. They, they really, they're focused and they're right in there. And I mean, we have the most precious congregation in the world. It's just a fabulous thing. We have 21 pastors who do nothing but sales. And we have, after six years now, no more programs. Uh, most of our pastors have actually come up through the cell structure. I have uh, a carpenter and, and I have a guy who was the campaign manager for the mayor and you know, just various demographics of people, uh, but they're precious and wonderful pastors and the cell leaders themselves. I mean, you just cannot believe the level of commitment and fire. This fall, we've been involved in doing some direct evangelism with the Southern Baptist called F-A-I-T-H, which they use. And we've had uh, hundreds of teams from cells going into the streets and doing follow-up. And what we did, uh, we actually went back to January and we followed up on every person who'd been saved since January. 850 people had been saved uh, that we had cards on, been baptized, and also we sent teams to them. In the process, they've led 850 more people to the Lord, just going out visiting people. And, and so we, we are seeing an explosion of evangelism and leadership. Now that, that's the first half of what I wanted to teach you. And I don't expect for you to understand everything about it. Uh, we have some materials over there. The baseball diamond stuff I think is over there under the tent. And you can get each of these booklets and you can look through them or uh, whatever you'd like to do. Maybe you develop your own. You know, you might have some lessons. The main thing is that you're teaching four things to people. How to preach, how to pastor, how to, how to prepare, and how to plant. Let me put prepare up here. Now, now we're coming to the end and a person's ready to start their own group. Now, can I erase this? Does everybody have this, this down? Anybody not have it? Okay. Uh, it's just, it's not a book. It's a message called Sons or Servants. And it's, it's really tremendous. Ten marks of a son or a servant in the house. Okay, I'm going to erase this. And now I'm going to move. Once you see how we prepare a person to be a leader... And you can do this as well. Now we're going to show you how a cell multiplies. Because I believe in the principle of multiplication. And I'll show you in just a minute how much I believe in it. All of our missions now is missions by multiplication. We, we don't do missions any other way except by multiplication. I'll explain that to you in a few minutes. Okay, good. Uh, everybody still here? Okay, that's the first half of our, our, our little talk. And, and by the way, this seminar, normally uh, we could go hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, but I'm just giving you a little overview for you guys to, uh, to at least have something to, to start thinking about. Now we come to what I call the principle of 12. First half of this lesson today was on vision. What is a cell church? What are you moving toward? Why are you doing it? What's the big deal? What's the point? Well, you can see there is a huge difference in structure and all, and all in a cell church. Now, we've got a person around the basis. You now know what it takes to turn them into a leader. And I'm going to draw a typical cell right here. Here's you as a leader. And you've got 12 people in your cell. Now, Typically, the way we have multiplied in the past is that we have multiplied by cleavage. We've, we divide the cell in half, and an intern takes half, and another, uh, the leader takes half, and never shall the twain meet again. And, and that's the way we have multiplied. Uh, we have also, by the way, how many of you in here today already have cells in your church? Put up your hand. Okay, great. So probably, it, how many of you would say that's the way we multiply groups right now? Put up your hand. Okay, quite a few of you like that now. And we still multiply groups like that. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a good method. And basically when they multiply, a lot of times they'll have an intern take half and another intern take half. And this smiling leader now goes up here and becomes what we call a section leader or a zone leader and no longer does cells. Now that, that, is, that is referred to as the Jethro model of cell oversight, and it's a strong management style. Very good. 
This is what we did the first four years as sales. A good way to start off because you have good, strong management at the beginning, and you need that because groups are just learning how to form and leaders are, have never multiplied. You really need strong management, and that's the way we did the first three or four years. Then several years ago, I went to Bogota, Colombia, uh, with Dr. Ralph Neighbors, and we studied this model of the principle of 12. Now, Bogota is in revival. I mean, the murder rate is eight times what it is here in the United States. People are scared, and they're just getting saved, I mean, by the multiplied thousands in these churches. And in the great International Charismatic Mission Church, they as well were in revival. Uh, but in 95, May of 95, they had 1,200 groups. By the end of that year, when they operated in the principle of 12, they had 4,000 groups. By the end of the next year, they had 10,000 groups. The pastor was nearly assassinated on his way home from church. You may have read about that. And he had to leave the country for eight months. Well, in his absence, the church grew from 10,000 cells to 17,000 cells. In his absence. So now they have 24,000 groups, but they only count them if they have six members who've been to an encounter retreat. So they only count 15,000 of those groups. So that's since uh, May of 95. So they are, they're in prolific, high growth. And that's why the principle of 12 is a different paradigm from the Jethro uh, model of cells, where when you reach a certain number, you multiply and you split, uh, in essence. You know, you're really breaking these relationships intentionally, and, and people don't like that. I don't know if you've ever found that with cells. They get a group up to 12, 15, everything's happy, feel the momentum, feel everything, and then all of a sudden, boom, we cut it in half, and it's six, and if one couple's on vacation or two, it's three. And, and all of a sudden, you went from 12 or 15 to three, and it feels like something got up and left, and people, you know, they also get up and leave. So this is, a, this is the difference. I want to teach you just a few minutes about the principle of 12 and how it works. Let's change the model a little bit at the cell level. And let's, let's just look at 12 people again sitting in a group on a weekly basis, loving each other, developing community, all of the things that, uh, that we're going to talk about. Now, these people uh, are, are ready to multiply. They, they, they've got it. They're, they're ready to multiply because they got 12. But here's what we're, how we're multiplying now. We take a person who's ready to become a leader. They've been all the way around the bases. They've been to the encounter retreat. They've done, they've done everything I just taught you. And they're ready to be a leader. They're in a cell. We tell that person, we want you to go and form your own cell with three or four people. A lot of them do it on the job, you know, but they continue every week to come back to the mother cell. If the mother cell meets on Sunday night or Wednesday night or Friday night, they stay in it because now they are going to be mentored by this leader. And can I tell you, I have discovered even a week, a great weakness of the principle of 12, and that is if you do not have one-on-one -on -one time with an individual who has become a leader, if someone is not spending one-on-one -on -one face to face discipleship with a person, chances are that individual will be a leader for a while but not for long term. Because they are, they are really going to glean most. In fact, a study I, I saw showed that leaders in a church 10% come from meetings, 90% come from one-on-one -on -one discipleship. So what we're going to have right here is a one-on-one -on -one discipleship relationship. Between this leader and this new leader. Now this guy goes to his job and he's got three or four guys that meet for prayer with him and it's a group. I, I have some people, they're showing John Maxwell tapes to Catholic laymen every Thursday at noon in Blue Cross. And they call it a cell. Well, hallelujah. I call that a subgroup. Now this is just a term I use. I coined it. It doesn't mean it's subpar, but it, it, it's identified in a different way. This group is full of non-church 
or non-Bethany members. Our, our church is named Bethany. Non-Bethany members. And, and, and they're, they're, they're really seeking to know the Lord. It's an evangelistic type group. Very evangelistic. But it is a cell, nonetheless. It's a subgroup. Well, this is a, this is a great dynamic that's happened here because we can say that this cell has multiplied. There's a parent, and there's the child. Regardless of what the child looks like, there's a child. There's a leader, and, there, and there's a child there. So now we have multiplied, but the original group is still intact. And here is the principle of Bogota's rapid, rapid growth. And that is you never break community. Once you form relationships, you maintain them. And another guy over here may do the same thing. He, or a lady, and she may go over here on her job or one Tuesday morning when, when her husband's at work and she starts a tea and she starts meeting with ladies. Well, now this person also is going to need to mentor them. one-on-one, -on -one, in some capacity. Now, we have personally learned that most cell leaders who are working a job can mentor well about three people. I mean, that's realistically how many they can meet with on a weekly or bi-weekly or tri-weekly basis. But the goal of the principle of travel, what they do in Bogota, they turn every member in the cell into a leader. Every member becomes a leader over time. And then it gets big. Because when every member of your cell has become a leader, you have 12 groups under you and 144 people. Well, when those people turn into leaders, you have 144 cells under you. And then it starts becoming generational. In Bogota, they refer to it as generations. I'm in my fourth generation. That means you have uh, 400 cells or 500 cells. I sat by this 26-year-old kid. He's got blue jeans, a little flak jacket, a little stubbly beard. And, and, and we're talking to him. And I said, uh, brother, uh, tell me about your cells. He was interpreted uh, back through. Uh, how many cells do you have? He said, 800. I said, how long have you been doing cells? He said, four years. He kept eating. He never stopped eating the whole time. He had 800 groups under him. And it all happened because of the principle of 12. I want you to open in your Bible to 2 Timothy 2, and I want to just point out a, another scripture or two here about this. Because now we're getting into the real meat of growth. P cells are wonderful to pastor people. I mean, we've closed the back door of our church since we started cells. We don't hardly have people leaving. Now, we do every now and then have somebody that'll leave, and they like another church better or the more convenient. But we were losing Huge numbers of people. That's, how, that's stopped now. 2 Timothy 2, you, you remember this verse, verse 2. And the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. There are four generations in that verse. First generation is Paul. Second generation is Timothy. Now, I believe that Paul had a 12. He had 12 guys who he discipled. You can read their names. Acts 20, uh, Philemon, and, and Philippians. You can read the names of the 12 guys that he traveled with. Demas was one of them who forsook him. But they traveled everywhere. He mentored. Jesus mentored 12 people. And I would really safely say that's about the maximum number of people you can mentor in a lifetime. Uh, good question for us to ask as pastors, who are my Timothys right now? Do I have 12 people that I am directly one-on-one -on -one mentoring? That's the second generation, and Paul had that. And history says Timothy took over the church at Ephesus, 50,000 members. He became the bishop, and Titus, and, and all of his 12 just really oversaw his work after his death. So, first generation, Paul. Second generation, Timothy's. Keep reading in the verse. It says, the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men. That's a third generation. Third generation, Timothy's 12. 
And the verse concludes, who will be able to teach others also. Fourth generation. So I would submit to you the gospel traveled in the book of Acts and the New Testament in a way different from what we're accustomed to. They had mighty signs and wonders. They had relationships with an apostolic team who traveled with Paul. He was mentoring them continually, even in jail. He said, you're my fellow yoke fellows. You're my fellow laborers. He was mentoring them with the goal of having them take over his work completely. And relationship is why the early church was so powerful and so strong. But we have very little relationships in our congregations. Most heads are facing one direction. They're looking at the back of somebody's head. I don't know about your church. I have a hard time getting them to stay till the end of the service. One doctor came, a medical doctor came to a pastor buddy of mine not too long ago, and he said, look, I just want you to know, you know, I'll be leaving at 1130 now on Sundays because the kickoff's at 12. This isn't a charismaniac church, which I'm one of. And he said, I'll be leaving at 1130. Can you imagine that? This is the lack of fear of God in our churches. I would have told him, don't let the door hit you on the way out, brother. But see, there's no fear of God, and, and our, our people have no real level of the fear of the Lord or commitment. And the funny thing, the doctor wanted to go watch the saints. Isn't that interesting? I mean, yeah, bad choice is right, but I think I'd rather be one than watch one, don't you? you? But you see, this is the level of commitment we're to. Well, it's not like that now in our congregation. And our people give. You can't believe how they give. How When they got in a relationship and someone was working with them and helping their family through uh, controlling problems and difficulties, well, we're, we're a little funny. We don't even pass offering plates in our church. Are, are we, we're, we have boxes by the door, like George Miller. And I teach on tithing, but I say very little about it. I let people walk forward and give a missions offering every Sunday, free will, which we give away, two, two and a half million dollars a year to missions. And they give. You can't believe how our people give. In fact, they, they give like twice as much as any church I've ever heard of. So our people are extremely committed now because of how well they're being pastored, how well they're being mentored. We did a study a couple of years ago, and in our whole church, 6,000 people, we could only find one divorce that took place in a whole year. One, which is one too many. But now people are dealing in a one-on-one -on -one basis. So what I'm saying to you is we, we start by taking people around bases and we turn them into leaders. Then we give them a context, a cell, where they can go out and develop their leadership gifts. And you see, there's not a lot of danger to this guy because he's been around the bases. He knows how to lead. And he goes out here and we just say, hey, just step up to the, to the plate and swing the bat. I mean, start a group. Start an alpha group from the, the curriculum in England. Start... Start a Chinese basketball group. I mean, start whatever you want to start. Get, get some people together. Now we're doing stuff called win a soul, plan a cell. And this guy's safe in his normal cell every week, but he goes out and he wins somebody to the Lord. Well, the first week, the first week after he does that, he said, can I come back? I have a book that I want to give you. And when he goes back to that person's home, he brings Christianity 101. And he starts taking that person around the bases, and they don't even know they're in a cell. And, and then they have their mom and their dad. And a cell, a subgroup has actually been planted out here, an evangelistic type group. And ultimately, these people get saved and come to Bethany, and they go around the leadership uh, development track. So we are encouraging people everywhere, plant cells, plant groups, not irresponsibly. We don't want people representing us who are not trained by us. But at the same time, do something lest you do nothing. And so they plan a group, but they continue to come back to the safety. Now, I want to give a title to this kind of cell. I've titled this one. I've called it a what kind of group? Subgroup. I mean, it's subpar. It's just a certain makeup of it. It's evangelistic in nature. There can be non-Bethany members there. The whole goal is to win those people. But I have a title for this kind of cell, and I can define it. It's mainly Bethany members... Bethany members, it's mainly for edification or one-on-one -on -one discipleship or ministering to those people. And I call this type of cell a G12 cell or a group of 12. G12 is short for a group of 12. 
Now this is the average Bethany cell right here. Bethany member, Bethany members sitting there with their families. Now, the loss can of course show up to that group. The loss can attend forever. We do not allow other church members to stay in these types of groups. We don't want to be open to the charge of stealing sheep. So if a person's from another church, we let them come for a month, then we encourage them to go back to their church and tell their pastor to start cells in their church, which has happened in many churches in Baton Rouge. I mean, I don't need to be taking sheep from other people. Can I have an amen to that? It's, I figured this out. Everybody in Baton Rouge can't fit in my church. You know, 400,000 people, they can't all fit. So I might as well be promoting other churches that are godly and have the same philosophy of the Word of God. So it, it, we, we do not allow people, we don't, we don't want to be open to that charge of stealing sheep. So this is primarily Bethany members, and, and each one of these people are going around the baseball diamond. They're enrolled in the classes. Well, this is a G12 cell, and the ultimate goal is like in Bogota, that all 12 of them become leaders. Now, realistically, is that going to happen in America? Well, in exceptional cases, it will. I have one man in our church, he has 14 members in his G12 type cell, Bethany regular old cell, and nine of them have their own group out of 14. And, and by the next six months, he says all 14 of his members are going to have a cell. Hallelujah. He's exceptional. I mean, he's a tremendous leader. One lady in my church has 11 of her members are leaders. So it's happening. But what I have observed is the average person is really successful if they even just get three who have gone out and planted a group from them and they're mentoring them one-on-one. -on -one. Now you see how the dynamic of church has changed. Instead of people just showing up on Sunday and being in your celebration, which is important, or Wednesday night, now they're developing transparent relationships. John Wesley started the Methodist Church with 60 people. He divided them into six groups of 10 and required them to meet every week as a cell. He called them classes. In fact, he was the original guy with cells, John Wesley. And John took those six groups and multiplied them to 10,000 cells in England. 100,000 people a week were in a weekly cell in the Methodist Church. And he was so strong about it that he said you had to be in 11 out of 13 meetings every quarter or you didn't get a ticket to be in the Methodist Church the next quarter. That's how strong John Wesley was and that's why he built such a strong foundation of discipling was through those groups. And they weren't your typical feel-good type groups. You sat around and every member had to answer four questions. Icebreaker first one was, what known sin have you committed in the last week? <laughs> Second one, what sin were you tempted to do that you did not do and what scripture did you use to overcome that temptation? And they had these questions and everybody went around the room and farmers and coal miners and people who had never been in relationship, never been in any kind of accountability with their soul, suddenly every week had to tell the state of their soul. And that's why discipleship grew, leadership grew. You would be amazed if you study John Wesley that the identical principles he put into England in the 1700s are what are fueling these massive cell churches around the world today. Can I erase this now? Has everybody got this diagram? All right, I'm going to erase it. And I'm going to move one step further. I'm watching my time pretty carefully. We're, we're doing real great here. Okay, I'm going to move one step further. We see that the ultimate goal is for a guy who opens a cell to turn all 12 of his members into leaders. And by the way, that's a pretty big stretch for somebody to be discipling 12 people. It can be done, but I am a firm believer that one-on-one -on -one Discipleship is the management structure of cells. In some context, somebody every week or two weeks needs to be alone with that leader for 45 minutes to an hour. How's it going? How's your wife? How are your kids? You doing okay? What are your goals? How can I help you reach them? And now we come to a definition of the principle of 12. And I want you to write this down. The simplest definition is helping... 12 friends 
to successfully reach their goals. Helping 12 friends to successfully reach their goals. The principle of 12 is a relationship.